data from the Homebody Institute for Internet Society. Uh, Benedict has the program of uh, knowledge uh, dimension at the, um, at the institute, and he's coming from Erfurt. Actually, my daughter is studying there. Uh, I mean, you studied at Erfurt, if that is correct. <laughs> um, interesting. And um, you will be talking about the path dependence um, of academic uh, value creation, impact infrastructure and innovation in academic publishing. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the warm introduction and also um, for the invitation to speak here. I actually just thought when I was listening to Kathleen's presentation that I should have been um, first up beca uh, because um, I think a lot of what I'm saying is, um, um, thank you, uh, background information for what um, um, Kathleen just said. Um, in my presentation, I want to offer a conceptual framework to understand why science um, is not able to use digital technology um, to its fully potential. I want to relate this framework to open science and in particular to publishing and um, to one approach that many European countries are following at the moment with regards to open access, the journal flipping approach. Um, because in my view, this um, journal flipping approach could have um, severe adverse effects and I would like to use this opportunity to discuss them with you. Um, the overall question that I'm trying to answer is, are we running the risk of repeating mistakes from the past? And some of the points that I'm trying to make or that I'm making are perhaps a bit provocative, but I think this could spark an interesting discussion afterwards. So to start off, um, we have to go back a bit in time and actually talk about the history of the typewriter, because I think it's a perfect metaphor to understand science today. So in the 1870s, somewhere in Milwaukee, the American inventor Christopher Latham Scholes invented one of the first typewriters. And his first designs repeatedly failed in the field because the type bars, the keys, would constantly block each other. Um, together with a stenographer, he worked on a new model or that Im improved the actual typewriter, um, which was the so-called QWERTY frequency. With a QWERTY frequency, the most commonly used type bars or keys in modern terms would not block each other because they were um, positioned as far as possible away on the keyboard. So this simple hack made it possible for Scholl's keyboard to become a commercial success. While America was in the midst of the industrialization, um, Scholl's keyboard became a little helper in almost every um, company in the, in, uh, throughout the country and later of course also worldwide. So please note, he was not the first one to invent the typewriter, but he was the first one to um, invent one that actually worked and that could be um, commercially used in, in many different um, contexts. And he invented a standard that still prevails today, the QWERTY keyboard. So now we have to jump a little bit again in time. Now it's, 90, it's the 1930s and August Dvorak, a professor at the University of Washington, um, invents the so-called DSK keyboard, the Torak Simplified Keyboard. With this keyboard, it was possible to type up to 40% faster than compared to um, the QWERTY keyboard that Scholes invented. However, despite its clear advantage over the QWERTY keyboard, the DSK keyboard of Tor um, from Torak never caught on. Um, Scholes' keyboard was clearly inferior, but it became the standard, and um, Torak's keyboard lost. Nobody is using it today. And even today, while there are no mechanical limitations anymore, we are still using um, the QWERTY keyboard. You can just have a look on your cell phone and you will probably find the QWERTY keyboard um, there as well. So this situation when an inferior um, standard prevails is called path dependent. Path dependent is a situation when, um, or is when a um, situation that was logic or a decision that was logical in the past leads to an inefficient system in the future. Um, and this despite the fact that the factors for this past decision are no longer relevant. Um, so even though there are no type bars that could block each other anymore, we are still using the QWERTY keyboard. This is a perfect example for path dependence. And there are a lot of explanations um, for this. Um, for example, network effects, um, when the use of something becomes higher, the more people use it. So the more um, people were using the QWERTY keyboard, or, um, um, the, the lower the fixed costs were, for example or also lock-in effects when um, the switching costs are considered too high to, um, for the market participants 
for example, switching from the, the QWERTY keyboard to the um, ESK keyboard, where a lot of people were already trained on the QWERTY keyboard. And of course, also the co so-called penguin effect, named after penguins on an ice floe, waiting for the first penguin to jump in the water to see if there are predators waiting. And I guess it's also comparable to open science in a way. <laughs> so what has this got to do with science today and academic publishing? Also, academic publishing can be described as a path-dependent system of knowledge creation and dissemination, where past decisions lead to inefficient system to inefficient system in the present. And this, I think, becomes particularly obvious in the case of open science. Many would argue that open science is a tautology because the words open and science state pretty much the same thing. Science is per definition open, at least when we believe um, some big shots of um, fi uh, science philosophy like Robert K. Merton or Karl Popper. Um, one, Merton, which you can see here, um, introduces five norms of science, and one of them is communism, which means that every scientific product be belongs to the scientific community, and another one is hmm? <laughs> communalism. And the other one is um, um, called um, altruism, which means um, um, that um, every scientist should work for the um, common good instead of the individual benefit. Popper, on the other hand, um, introduced this critical rationalism um, as the idea that nothing should ever be considered as the final truth. So this um, idea of falsification, which becomes apparent in the idea of the black swan, so um, um, the sightings of a thousand um, white swans might suggest that um, all swans are white, but unless, um, but since when, when you see one that is black, of course, this idea is falsified. So these book old ideas resonate very, very well in the term open science, a term that we use um, today for a multitude of ideas of how science can cope best with technology or best at least in the interest of the scientific um, community. For example, Open data means that we can use data of published results um, in order to replicate these results and test them if they are right or wrong. And this really relates to Karl Popper's idea of critical rationalism. But of course, as you know, only a few researchers at the moment um, make the data openly available. Also, open access means, well, in a very simplified term, that scientific publications are available to everyone and this clearly relates to Merton's idea of communis, communism, commun, communalism. Um, and, um, and data publications are, commons, um, um, are a commons that every scientist should have access to. But um, most of the um, research papers are still hidden behind paywalls. So in that way, open science can be seen as the old and the new um, scientific paradigm or the old and the new scientific production mode. Um, as it translates an established scientific identity to the digital age. In reality, however, um, science often fails to seize the opportunities that um, the digitization has to offer. And here I believe um, path dependence can again serve as an explanation because much of, the <coughs> much of the situation today reaches back to decisions from the 60s and 70s when the Science Citation Index was founded by Garfield and um, when um, more and more scientific communities or informed societies um, outsource their journals to commercial publishers. And today the, the dominance of bibliometrics to evaluate research and the dominance of a few commercial publishers in the scientific value creation um, lead to a situation where libraries can barely pay licensing fees while some publishers have an incredible um, profit margin. I think um, this um, 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 graphic shows quite well how um, a few publishers um, and became stronger and stronger in, um, um, in, this, in the market for scientific publishing. And this, I guess, is the reason, of course, why we are here today, um, because we see the internet and um, digital technologies as a way to overcome our path dependence and to make science more accessible and transparent and inclusive. And um, still, the question um, that is open that I posed at the beginning is, if we are reproducing the status, the status quo, so in this um, last part of my presentation, I want to offer an answer to this question, which might be not too satisfactory, but which I hope can um, serve as a fertile ground for a discussion afterwards. The example that I want to use is um, journal flipping, and um, in particular, the deal negotiations in Germany at the moment. So 
in the deal negotiations, uh, a consortia of, um, well, German libraries, universities, and institu institutions negotiate with academic publishers um, on a new open access model. In this idea of a big flip scenario, um, scientific institutions would pay, pay a, um, a lump sum that covers publication costs of all papers whose, whose first authors are at German institutions. These papers would be available open access to everyone. At the same time, um, German scholars receive access to all publishers, on, um, all publishers' online content. This approach is similar to the one that the Netherlands took and Finland took and Austria took, all of which had to um, settle, I think it's fair to say, um, with far less than they um, um, started at. Still, ideally, this flipping model um, eventually leads to a big flip in which publishers would pay and would publish open access by default. And um, of course, this or also this big flip um, would be cost effective at, at, um, according to an estimate by the uh, Max Planck Society. Um, because the, the, the cost per paper estimated at the moment is um, between 3,800 and 5,000 euros. And um, in this big flip scenario would be in between um, 1,400 and 2,000 euros, I believe. And so far, um, um, Springer, Nature, and Wiley um, seem open to the model, but it seems that um, Elsevier is um, um, still a bit glitchy, probably because it would lose the most. So, journal flipping and um, package deals, um, I think, are powerful tools and could be a, a game changer, um, um, like, in a, for a, in, a, in a short moment of time, but I think they come um, with high future costs, and these I don't, I think, do not necessarily relate to money that is spent on publication by libraries alone, but, and here again in relation to part dependence, um, to the adverse effects it could have in future. So I have um, um, three bold assumptions, and I think there the, um, um, the, the typewriter comes into play again. And one of them is, um, um, like one reason why I think this could lead to adverse effects is that it excludes small players. I think large scale package deals are, a, well, a great solution for um, um, rich countries and rich institutions, but it excludes players um, that cannot buy in. The second one is um, that we are pretty much subsidizing an old product. Given that many peer reviewed papers are, um, not, um, are, not, are not even cited once and have almost no disciplinary impact, um, the Journal flipping model would pretty much give no um, incentive to cut down on papers and instead, for example, invest in alternative um, um, scientific products, for example, data or software code. And third one, which I think is um, perhaps the strongest, is that the journal flipping model reproduces the dependence from a few commercial publishers um, that will likely continue to wield oligop oligop oligopolistic power that they have already. So coming back to the title of my presentation, the, the journal flipping model approach perpetuates the same infrastructure um, as before, and it probably perpetuates the same uh, measures for impact, and it's therefore not an innovation. It is perhaps only a first step towards publishing truly open in the digital age, and we still need to ask ourselves what are new models that would truly transform the scientific value creation. And this is why I thought this um, presentation would have been good before, because um, this was actually already a, a good answer, I think, because um, um, investing in public infrastructures on a large scale, um, I think, could be a, a better alternative solution. So, this is it. Thank you very much for um, your attention, and I'm happy to discuss um, the ideas further now. Also, I might use the opportunity um, to, well, it's not here anymore. <laughs> well, a, a few colleagues in mine, um, um, we started a, a blog journal, it's called, it's Elephant in the Lab, and we are um, just discussing science policy matters there. And um, everyone is, of course, invited to read and, of course, also to participate and contribute to the um, blog journal. Okay. Thank you very much. I think there are probably many questions about that. So who would like to start? Lee. I'll come over myself and switch the microphone later. Thank 
million Wolfram. Thanks a million for such a um, stimulating talk. I'm really glad to see somebody challenging the flipping model that appears to have become almost a unquestioned belief system amongst certain people in the open science uh, area. And it's really good to see this scientific questioning of this, um, this model going on, not least because, as you mentioned, the um, reproducing this disadvantages not just poorer institutions, but an entire part of the globe, of the planet, who simply cannot engage in this. And I'm very glad to see this um, made very clear at this early stage, and particularly before Jeffrey Sachs comes to talk to us about the global, the sustainability goals. Last year at OR, we had a um, keynote from Laura Chernovich from the University of Cape Town, and she made exactly this point in a very graphic way, that actually, that what we're doing in open science in the global north may actually be disadvantaging seriously the discoveries and the knowledge that is so important for climate change um, science and for um, medicine in that other part of the world. Have you got any ideas on what the way forward might be um, that the other the alternative to this? Yeah, um, well, I, I don't have a big solution, but I, I think the, the, the journal flipping model can only be a, a first step, perhaps, because it, it is um, on a, on a, in, in a short term, it can have a, a high impact on the availability of publications. But as you also said, it comes with severe disadvantages, at least in my opinion, and I think a few people share that as well, and especially also when it comes to the exclusion of players. And I think this doesn't um, really um, um, fit with the idea of, of open access. And um, an alternative idea, which I think also um, um, Kathleen proposed, would be um, to rather invest in an innovative topic infrastructure for um, um, open science, which um, of course not only limits um, publications to, for example, articles, but also would allow to, um, um, to um, um, archive, for example, data or software or code or any other material that could contain scientific knowledge and make it um, possible to evaluate it and make it possible to, um, um, to, to give credit for it to um, to have the whole um, um, the whole knowledge distribution system again in a in a public infrastructure, I think this would be something um, um, very positive. And um, just I'm, I'm I'm not anti-commercial or anti-companies, but I think um, um, a lot of the um, um, dependencies led to a bad situation. And I wouldn't mind if a, a company, for example, would build an innovative infrastructure unless it is um, still in the hands of um, the scientific community. And then I think these um, 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 public infrastructures um, could um, be um, a real game changer compared to um, the journal flipping model. Further questions? Well, actually, I have, a, I have two questions, I would say. So just touching upon what was said before, um, is this a public infrastructure that you envision or is it an infrastructure that is in the control of the public? I mean, that I think is a slight difference, maybe the difference between communism and communalism. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, 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 I'm not 100% sure if I um, 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 understand the question correctly, but I guess it, it should be um, um, a public infrastructure and in the, in the hand of, um, um, uh, I mean, it, could, it should serve the public and it should be in the hands of academics managing it. So well, it could be, I mean, you could imagine to outsource the, the complete infrastructure to um, um, industry, yeah, that is uh, possible. Well, like, um, I think um, um, what, I, what, I, what I saw um, um, a lot also from, from um, working for a while in, in research infrastructure and um, um, looking at um, um, which um, infrastructure projects were funded um, by public funds, I, I often see that um, uh, this doesn't, doesn't relate to, 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 to all of them, but there are often um, 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 infrastructure projects that are funded with public funds and they run for three years and then they, they are gone. So they, they don't have um, um, a real opportunity to, to, ca to, to catch on or um, um, to, to become important in any way. And um, I'm, I'm not sure if um, a market player could handle that better, um, but at least um, a lot of the products that I see in the market look 
it is sexier than the ones that are um, um, produced by um, um, people in libraries. That that sounds horrible, but I, I, I guess that, that could be um, um, a good um, um, collaboration in a way, at, as long as the, the infrastructure itself um, um, stays in, in the in the hands of academia. Because I think this is um, um, the true problem that that we have today, and that we are just reproducing again. All right. Any further comments on that? Three, two, one. So thank you again.